People always want to know, does testosterone cause prostate cancer? Well, today I'm going to answer that for good. I'm Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. Today, I'm going to share with you data from the Traverse trial that looked at prostate safety in men getting testosterone replacement. Now, this is really exciting because this is the largest randomized controlled trial that we have to date looking at testosterone replacement therapy and specifically looking at safety. Now, I've talked about this before, uh, looking at the safety of testosterone therapy in patients who have cardiovascular health issues or health concerns. And so this new data is specifically looking at prostate cancer concerns as well as symptoms related to an enlarging prostate or lower urinary tract symptoms. You may not know, but prostate cancer is hormonally sensitive. So often we treat patients who have prostate cancer with medications that decrease your testosterone level. Now, but does that mean that if you don't have prostate cancer, giving you testosterone is going to cause prostate cancer? Now, even before this study came out, many of us would say, no, that doesn't make any sense, right? But now we have concrete data. There's also a concern that giving testosterone can cause worsening of urinary symptoms because it may cause prostate growth. Now, as I discussed previously on my video looking at natural ways to reduce enlarged prostate, while prostate growth is related to hormones, particularly when you're going through aging through your teenage years and up to your young adult, your prostate is very hormonally sensitive and you need testosterone for it to grow to mature size. But as men age, their testosterone decreases and their prostate continues to grow. So that theory doesn't really have legs. But based on this data, I can now tell you, does testosterone increase your risk of prostate cancer, make your urinary symptoms worse, or increase the size of your prostate? Well, let's get into it. So this study looked at over 5,000 men who are all on average 63 years of age and had either pre-existing cardiovascular disease or had an increased risk of cardiovascular disease because it was initially designed to look at cardiovascular outcomes. Now, these men were then randomized to either receive testosterone replacement in the form of a gel that you put on your arm, your buttock, or your abdomen daily, or get no testosterone replacement or meaning a placebo gel. Now, in order to be defined as being hypogonadal or having low testosterone, they had to have testosterone levels of below 300 on two separate blood draws, as well as symptoms of low testosterone. That can be symptoms like having fatigue, low energy, erectile dysfunction, low libido, decreased muscle mass, increased fat, or even depression. So they could have had any of those symptoms, and as well as low testosterone as defined on blood work. Now their testosterones were followed or they were required to maintain levels between 350 nanograms per deciliter to up to 750 nanograms per deciliter. And the primary endpoint, meaning what they powered the study to look at was high grade prostate cancer, meaning that men who had a Gleason score of four plus three or higher. Now, prostate cancer is very slow growing, and we know that lower grades of prostate cancer are less likely to become metastatic or problematic. And so this is why they chose high-grade prostate cancer, which is really the concerning prostate cancer, to choose their primary outcome. Now, their secondary outcome was any prostate cancer, as well as urinary retention, needing some sort of invasive prostate procedure, having new pharmacologic intervention for prostate or getting a prostate biopsy to assess for prostate cancer. Now, when they were deciding about prostate biopsies, they had very specific guidelines on who to refer for biopsies. And this is because when we think about giving testosterone, if you have low testosterone, particularly around below 240, 230, your testosterone or androgen receptors are not fully saturated. So giving testosterone is going to get all those receptors saturated and you will see an increase in PSA. So then you can imagine the researchers didn't want everyone who got testosterone to refer anyone with a slight bump just to get a biopsy because that's not really realistic, right? And based on prior studies, we're seeing that if men go from about 240 to about 500, you're seeing an increase in PSA by about 0.47 at 12 months. So again, this is confirmed in data. So basically, if they had an increase from baseline of 1.4 nanograms per milliliter or more, they were considered for a prostate biopsy or over four if they were not taking any medications, over two if they were taking medications like finasteride or dutasteride that can decrease your PSA by half, 
or if they were below 55 and their PSA went above 3. But those were all indications for biopsy. If they felt a nodule at any time, that was also indication for biopsy and if they felt any sort of induration. Now, these patients who met these criteria were asked to watch a video about PSA screening and prostate biopsy, and then they were asked if they wanted to proceed with prostate biopsy. Now, this is completely by the guidelines because there's so much information to understand about PSA screening and deciding to go ahead with biopsy, it is a shared decision-making model, meaning we share this information with you and you decide if you want to proceed because we know that prostate cancer is extremely slow growing and that if you are, say, within 10 years of the end of your life, that likely something else will cause your demise over prostate cancer. We actually stop screening for people who have less than 10 years of life. And so it's really a very sort of controversial topic and important to discuss with your doctor in detail. Now, these men were followed for on average 33 months. So that's a pretty long time. 92% made it to a full year, 74% to about two years, and 57% to about three years. And then it dropped off quite precipitously at four years. And so what they found was that the incidence of high-grade prostate cancer in the active group, meaning the ones that got testosterone replacement and those that didn't, was very, very similar. It was 0.19% and 0.12%. So I'm going to show you guys what the results are here on this graph. Now, this is called a forest plot. So that line down the middle, if you cross that line, that means that your data is not significant. It means that it's crossing. It can be it can be favorable or not favorable. And so you can see that at all the endpoints, including high-grade prostate cancer, any prostate cancer, urinary retention, needing a procedure, having pharmacologic intervention, and getting a biopsy, there was no significant difference between people who got TRT and people who didn't. Now, I will say the caveat that I explained to you how these men got biopsied. So in these 5,000 men, they saw about 85 with elevated PSA that met criteria. Now, only a small subset of them in both groups went on to get the biopsy. Now, this is, again, why I explained the nuances of shared decision-making. So only less than 20% in each group went on to get biopsy. So ultimately, the good news is if you're taking testosterone replacement or considering taking testosterone replacement, it does not increase your risk of prostate cancer or high-grade prostate cancer. And it does not increase your risk of having urinary complications, needing a procedure for uh, your prostate, needing medication, or having an issue where you can't urinate and need a catheter. So that is really reassuring and, again, provides really important safety data on testosterone replacement. If you want to learn more about testosterone replacement, check out my prior videos on testosterone replacement. We even have a podcast episode with Dr. Jonathan Clavel where we talk about testosterone replacement. You might enjoy that as well. And as always, we're going to take care of yourself because you're worth it.